Section Algebra 2, greeting students, lesson 37. Uh, welcome to week 11 of our studies. This is the week of American Thanksgiving. And so, and my students have all been killing it, really working hard, getting their work done, just on top of their games. So students, um, I am giving you a break in your homework. I'll explain at the end of the lesson exactly what that will look like. But if you are a student who's just watching via YouTube, which is fabulous, welcome. Uh, I encourage you to, if you are caught up on your homework and you have been on top of your game so far this year, then I welcome you to um, also give yourself a little break in your homework. We're, man, 10 weeks is a long time to do all this homework. So that's your reward. All right, today we're doing a two-part lesson. The first part is algebra. It is super practical. If you ever take chemistry, you'll have to make these calculations. So I'm doing you a favor by explaining them to you ahead of time. And uh, they're super useful and not that hard. The second part of our lesson is a little blast of geometry. And let me just look to edit. Yeah, it's cool. There's some actual problems that we do. So, let's dive in. In talking about chemical compounds, there's a couple things that I want you to know. Like I said, this is the subject of a chemistry class and I'm not going to be your chemistry teacher, um, but I'm gonna tell you just enough so that you can be dangerous and work these problems. The first thing that I want you to know is that there are little tiny things in the world called atoms, right? Um, they come in many different flavors. We have a thing called the periodic table of elements that tells us all the different kinds of atoms that there are. But atoms naturally group together in certain kind of funky combinations and they make what are called compounds. Combinations is another word that makes sense, but compound is the scientific word. As you can see, that's what we'll be talking about, right? Now, for our purposes, John will always tell us the recipe of how these guys group together from atoms to compounds. So it'll always be done according to a recipe. And John will, like I said, John will give us all the details we need to know on that. But here's a simple example. Here's a compound you've probably heard of, H2O. That is the compound that we call water. And we can tell from the recipe that it's made of two hydrogen atoms. Because if we had a, a periodic table of elements in front of us, we'd know that H is the symbol for hydrogen. And that little two tells us that we're gonna need two of them. There's no little number after the O, so that means we need one oxygen atom. It's just like with exponents, um, only scientists write their little number down below, okay? So we know that whenever we're combining the atoms that make up water, we're gonna need them in to be in this proportion, right? This will make us one molecule, that's another name for this. To make one molecule of water, we need this many, but what if we wanted to make 100 molecules of water? Then we'd have to have 200 and 100. That's what this lesson is all about, is figuring out how to do that. Now, here's the thing that I already kind of told you. Every atom has a weight, a literal weight. They don't weigh very much, but they do weigh something. That is what we call the gram atomic weight. If we wanna find the chemical compounds, the weight of a chemical compound, and we need to know how much each one of these atoms weighs. This just tells us the number of atoms, but this doesn't tell us the weight. John will give us that information in the problems. He will give us the weights in the problems. We don't have to know that. The third thing we need to know 
is that if we have the recipe and we have the weights, then we can calculate something called the gram molecular weight of the compound. Oops, compound. Okay, so the atoms are the ingredients in our recipe. We are told how many we need to combine and we're told how much they weigh. We can put all those ingredients together, stir them up, and we can calculate what we call the gram molecular weight of the total compound or the molecule. Compound and molecule, remember, for our purposes mean the same thing. The way that we're gonna do this is by use of our old friends, the ratio problems. And remember that the way I do those is with what, we, what I call a tic-tac-toe board, right? Although I usually put sides and a bottom of it. But we're gonna use this organizer and if you studied Algebra 1 with me, then you already know what I'm talking about. And if not, I'll explain. Okay, so that's the way we're gonna set all of this up. Let's practice. Once you get the hang of how to set it up, it becomes quite satisfying. Because it sounds really hard and complicated, but you can make sense of it real easy. Example 37.1. All right. Now, I'm gonna read it to you, but I'm gonna say blah, blah, blah for the numbers because I don't want you to worry about that. The chemical formula for water is H2O. Okay, we knew that, I, I spoiled this for you, all right? That's the chemical formula, or as I like to say, the recipe. If we have 3,600 grams of water, what is the weight of the oxygen? And then it says O16H1. All right, so let's dive in and figure out what to do with all of this. We're going to make a ratio but it's a ratio table, but it's gonna be bigger than what we've seen before. We're gonna have a row for hydrogen, because that's the first thing we're combining, and we're gonna have a row for oxygen, because that's the second element, and then we're gonna have a total row. Okay, now for our columns. The first column, we're gonna ask, what are the number of atoms? And that's, we get that from the recipe, okay? Then the next thing we're gonna need to know is the atomic weight. John will tell us that, he did, he gave it to us in the problem. That's cool. Then from this, we'll be able to find the molecular weight or the weight of the compound and then we'll compare that to the actual actual number of molecules that we have molecular weight let's just say of one molecule so that you understand that all right so we have more columns than we had before but this is going to help us figure it out Th understanding what's going on in these columns is my job to help you understand it. Um, but let me just show you how it works. All right, so we know that the chemical formula for water is H2O. Okay, that's the recipe. And then John writes this at the end of the problem. O comma 16 semicolon H comma one. These are the atomic weights. All right, make sure you understand the difference between the two. This will be written with some kooky letters. Sometimes there's a lowercase letter that follows the uppercase. Um, these are the names of the atoms as found in the periodic table of elements. The little subscript numbers tells how many of them. All right, so we're gonna start in this column by saying, okay, the number of atoms we need, we look at the recipe, we're gonna need two of oxygen, or hydrogen, sorry, and one of oxygen, and we don't need to find the total. And for these first two 
columns, we can just cross out the total row. We don't need them for the first two. Now, okay, so this information helped us fill in the first column. This information helps us fill in the second column, the atomic weights. Okay, hydrogen weighs one gram per atom. Oxygen weighs 16 grams per atom. Okay, so again, just see how I've copied this. John's gonna give us all this information. And here's the thing, we don't really have to completely understand it. Just know that that's the recipe and those are the weights. Now, to get the molecular weight, we multiply. Two, 16. Now we're ready to get a total. Because when we make one molecule of water, it's gonna weigh 18 grams. Two of those grams come from the hydrogen. 16 of those grams come from the oxygen. Now we go back to the book and are told we have 3,600 grams of water. Water is the combination. So that number goes here, right? We're not, this, weight, this is not the weight of the hydrogen or the oxygen. It's the weight of the water, and the water represents the total. Um, and then the question says, what is the weight of the oxygen? So the X goes here. That's what we're supposed to find out. Now, just like we've done in these problems in the past, we can gently squiggle out the row we don't know. We don't need that information. We needed it to calculate, right? That was important. We couldn't have gotten this 18 unless we added the two to it. But now we don't need it because we see that we're interested in the other rows. So we gently squiggle it out and then we make our proportion out of this. 16 over 18 equals x over 3,600. We cross multiply, 16. Remember, don't multiply these out because they very often will cancel, right? Cross multiply. It doesn't matter if you start like with this side or start with this side. I usually start here. What is very important though is that you multiply opposites together, right? Top and bottom, bottom and top. That's important. Remember, this X is me showing the cross multiplying. All right, and then we're gonna divide both sides by 18. And this shows you why it's fabulous not to multiply these because it's much easier to cancel if this is two numbers instead of one. This is gone. 18 goes into 36 twice. So this is gonna be 200, right? Accounting for the two zeros. And this goes to one, so my denominator's gone. So x, equals, and let's see, 16 times two is 32, and then I smack on a couple more zeros. 30, 3,200 grams of oxygen. That's how much the oxygen will weigh if we have that much water. All right. That's the right answer. The recipe is the first column. The atomic weights that John tells us is the second part. All right, let's do another one. I think there's one more. Yes, there are three more. Two more, sorry, three in all. Example 37.2. These problems, once you get the hang of them, will make you feel super smart. I guarantee it. Okay, 37.2, we wanna draw another. We know it's gonna be a fairly big tic-tac-toe board. I like to give myself plenty of room because you know what? Whenever something feels confusing to you, put more white space in, give it more room. We look in and we see, okay, the chemical formula for ammonia, cleaning agent, right, is NH3. Okay? Every uppercase letter means a different chemical. I'll tell you that. Sometimes they have lower cases when like there's, there's more than one element that has an N, so the other one has to be like Na or whatever. This is the recipe. So I know I'm gonna need a row for the Ns, a row for the Hs, and then I'm gonna need a total row. The first number 
is the, I, I can just write recipe in here. That might be easier. I did it kind of sciency last time. Now I'm just being straightforward. Then we'll put in the weights and John gives us those. They are always at the end of the problem. It's H1, N14. And this is the way John always writes them. He writes the, the name of the atom, then he puts a comma, and then he puts the weight of that. Then the semicolon means he's moving on to the next one. So H equals one, N equals 14. Scientists do not write it the way mathematicians wish they would. They write it their own way. So these are the weights. All right, and we remember we don't need the total row in the beginning. We know that this will give us the molecular weight. And then the last row, which I need to build better, will give us the actual number of things that we're talking about. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. The recipe calls for, remember if there's nothing written there, it's a one. So we get one atom of nitrogen and three of hydrogen. Then we get the weights and they're out of order, but that's okay, we can manage that. It's 14 goes with the N and one goes with the hydrogen. And then we multiply 14 and three. Then we add to get the total, okay? If it helps you, you can write times equals times equals. Okay, that's another little add-on. You don't need to do that, um, but if you're confused about how am I combining these numbers again, then that is the way to go. All right, John says, if we have 510 grams of ammonia, oh, that's the combined thing, 510. And I know that because John starts the problem by saying the chemical formula for ammonia. So I know this is ammonia. I didn't have to know that from my chemistry brain. Um, and so then when John says that we have 510 grams of ammonia, we go, oh yeah, that's the name of the compound. Then, how much does the nitrogen weigh? Okay, the nitrogen is the N. So we put the X there, squiggle this line out. We needed it, but not anymore. And now I'm ready to set this up. 14 over 17 equals X over 510. We cross multiply. Four times 150 equals 17. No, I'm sorry, I, I transposed that, didn't I? It's 510 equals 17x. I divide both sides by 17. That looks great. 17 into four. Hmm. I don't see that working at all. There's nothing that connects there. So I'm gonna assume, because John is almost always really nice with these problems. I'm gonna assume that 17 goes into 51. But how many times? That's the question. Now, I know that 17 times something equals 51, and I'm guessing at what that might be, but what I'm guessing is that 17 times something has to end with the one, so I'm gonna guess it's three. Because I'm guessing that if you multiply 17 times three, you're gonna get a one in, that, a one in the ones place, right? 17 times three, let's see, three times seven is 21, there's the one I wanted. Three times one is three plus two more, aha. So it does go in evenly. This reduces to not three, but 30, right? Because we have a zero there. That goes away. And what that tells me, oh, I copied this wrong, didn't I? That should be a 14, not a four right there. There's the 14. I just copied it wrong over here. So I put the one back. And now I know 14 times 30 is going to give me my answer. Let's see, that's 12. It's gonna be 420 grams of nitrogen. And I can just use the abbreviation. 
G is grams, N is nitrogen. And that's my final answer. Yay. Okay, let's do one more. Thirty-seven point three. Draw my chart. The formula for ammonium chloride is ready N H four. CL. See how that's a lowercase l? That's how I know that's not a separate ingredient. It's just the name of this ingredient is CL. So this tells me I'm going to have three ingredients. It doesn't make it any harder. It just makes the problem a little longer. So now I know I've got a row for N, H, CL, and then a total row. First, I'll write in the recipe. Then I'll write in the weights. Then I'll have the molecular weight, which is again, the weight of the whole compound. These are atomic weights. I don't wanna bog you down in the science, but I also don't wanna confuse you. And then this will be the actual number of molecules that we have, or atoms, depending on what John tells us. All right, he also gives us, okay, so this we know is the recipe. And then he gives us the weights and there are three of them. So I'm just gonna make a list of them rather than write it like John does this way, just cause I'm running out of room. N, 14, H, one, CL, 35. And this is in parentheses, okay? Um, with semicolons at the end. Now, I just wanna say this, if you're ever not sure about what this recipe is telling you, sometimes it helps to look at the weights because here I can see, oh yeah, there's an N and there's an H and then there's an ingredient called CL. So if this is ever confusing to you and you're not sure how many different uh, ingredients are in your recipe, go ahead and look at the weights and that should help you figure it out. All right, so the recipe, again, if there's no number, I know it's a one, so I need one, atom of N, I'm gonna need four of hydrogen, and this is chlorine, this Cl, and that's a one also. All right, now we'll put in the weights in the next column, 14, one, and 35. Thank goodness there's a lot of ones because the math is easy. Remember that if you want to, you can write multiply and equal here, if that helps you. We don't need the total row in the first two columns. It helps me to cross that off so I don't confuse myself by thinking something's supposed to go in there. Then we add all this up. Eight and five is three. Carry the one that's 53. Okay, so one molecule of this equals 53 grams, 14 of N, that's nitrogen, four of hydrogen, 35 of chlorine. That's the minimum that you can have. That's just one molecule of this thing. But we have got a situation where there's more than one. John says, how many grams of chlorine are there? In 1,060 grams of ammonium chloride. And again, that's the name of the big thing. So we know it's here. All right, if you're ever confused, look back at the problem and it started out by saying the formula for ammonium chloride is that. So we know that ammonium chloride is the name of the whole thing. So when it tells us at the end that there are 1,060 grams of ammonium chloride, we know, oh, that's the, that's the combination, the total thing. Okay, these are the weights. Let me just write that too so you remember where we got all this. These things will always be given to you in the problem. Multiply and then you find your ratios. Okay, so we're looking for the weight of the chlorine that would be included in this number of molecules we're dealing with. Now we can see, okay, we don't need either of these anymore, right? 
and we can go 35 over 53 equals x over 1060. We can cross multiply. That will tell us that 35 times 1060 equals 53 times x. Again, don't multiply. Divide both sides by 53. That looks perfect. There's our x. 53 doubled would be 106, right? Do you notice that pattern there? So that means 53 times what? 20. Yes, 53. I'm just going to double check it to make sure I've got the right number of zeros. It would be 0, 6, 10. Okay, so I just double checked that. This is a 20. And now I can say that x equals 700, right? Because 2 times 35 would give me 70, and then another times 10. 700 grams of chlorine. That's the right answer. Yay. Okay. That is uh, the algebra piece of this. Now we're going to slather on a little geometry and we're going to talk about parallelograms. All right. When we talk about parallelograms, they are within the family of quadrilaterals, which are all the things that have four sides. And here's what's um, and then remember that quadrilaterals can be divided into three categories. They can be no sides parallel, or they can be two sides parallel, or they can be four sides parallel. In this one, these are the two sides that are parallel. This is called a trapezoid. We're not gonna talk much more about that today. Um, generally, we're more interested in things that are more uniform. And the cool thing about parallelograms is that that side is parallel, but also, those sides are parallel. And this is what we call a parallelogram. And that's what we're interested in. This we're never going to talk about. This we'll talk about a little, but not as much. Okay. So what's important about parallelograms? They have a number of interesting features. Um, I said that word funny, and I just have to tell you the story. I'm from Michigan originally. And I don't think I ever really had a strong Midwestern accent, but there is such a thing as a Midwestern accent, upper Midwest, Great Lakes area. Uh, they tend to say their vowels kind of nasally. Like my kids always noticed it because when their cousins, who are all Michiganders, would be calling to their moms, they would say, Mom, Mom, I want some milk. Um, some milk, that's how they would say milk, like, you know, a glass of milk. Um, milk, like it was an E. And then my oldest daughter's name is Molly, and they would always call her Molly, like that. They would really exaggerate it. So we um, are very sensitive to those Michigan accents. And, oh my gosh, I always worry that I have one. <laughs> but I don't think that I do. But I spoke to a woman who works in the Detroit area, you know, in Michigan. Um, I was doing some business with her and she had such a Michigan accent. I was 
dying. And I spoke to her last Friday, but ever since, like three days ago, but ever since then now I'm super paranoid whenever I say my vowels that I, I'm afraid I sounded like her. She's a really smart lady, but man, accents just have a way. So anyway, when I said that word funny, I was like, oh my gosh, my Michigan accent, is it coming out? But I don't think I have it. Okay, here are some things about parallelograms that are cool. The parallel sides have equal lengths. Which, oops, which makes perfect sense because these have to be the same so that these guys can be the same, right? In a trapezoid, these are different lengths, so this gets all wonky. But in this one, the two sides that match have to be the same. Second tidbit, opposite angles have equal measures. Please write this all down, I'm sorry. I'm making it as short as can be. What that means is that this angle and this angle are the same, and this angle and this angle are the same. Well, that's kind of cool, right? Three, this one becomes super, super practical for the problems we're gonna do. Any two uh, angles that are next to each other, right? We said that opposite angles are the same, but if you add two that are next to each other, any two, it doesn't matter, they will add to, one, to 180. Huh, that's kind of cool, right? And here's the fourth one. What's an uppercase D? The diagonals bisect each other. And this one I'm gonna draw a picture of because it's the hardest one to see. Here's my cool parallelogram. I'm drawing it tipping the other way. I always think when I'm talking about parallelograms, you know when you were a kid and you played in cardboard boxes and you know how they would all, you'd open it up so you could make like a tunnel, right? And go through it. And they would always start to tip over. That's what I always think of is it's a cardboard box that's been played in for a while and it's tipping. Okay, so here are, here's my parallelogram. And these are called diagonals, and it's kind of self-explanatory. They're the lines that go kitty corner across it. Now, these diagonals clearly are gonna be different shape, different lengths, right? Because this way is longer than this way, right? Just based on the way this thing is tipped. But what we're talking about is that this is equal to this. They chop each other in half, and then this one chops this one in half. So this section is equal. To that section. All four of these facts are going to be useful because we're going to do some fun little geometry problems and we'll need to refer to those. So parallel sides have equal lengths, opposite angles have the same measure, adjacent angles add to 180, and the diagonals bisect each other. All right, you've got all that written down. If not, pause me. I guess you have to rewind at this point because I hear. I'll put it back. Um, if you need more time to write this down, please do pause me and come back when you're done. Okay, I'm assuming you're back. 37.4, if you're not, I'll never know. Okay, ABCD is a parallelogram and some angle is 65 degrees. And then we're supposed to find the other angles in an X and a Y. Woo, it's a lot. Let's draw a picture and I'm gonna make it big so you can see it really well. I do recommend that you draw the parallelogram because it will help you understand what's going on. Because there is a lot going on. First we have A, B, C, D. We're gonna need that because John's referring to the angles by their letters. So we're gonna need to know. John has drawn in the diagonals, and that perks up my ears because I remember the one, oh, that's not very even, but pretend. Um, the diagonals bisect each other, I know that. 
This one, John draws it like that. Y plus seven, this is seven, this is four. I'm gonna put a little circle there just to help me see what the heck that is. And this one is X plus two. And that's the length of the half the diagonal, right? This much is X plus two, this much is seven, this much is Y plus seven, this much is four. I think I'm gonna circle these just so it all looks the same. And John tells us that angle BAD is 65 degrees. BAD, this one, is 65 degrees. Okay, so then we're supposed to find angle ADC, and he writes it like this, the measure of angle ADC. That means he's saying find ADC, okay, that's this one, and find the, ang the measure of that. Okay, well, that one's not opposite that one, so we know it's not 65, but what's the rule about adjacent angles? Oh yeah, they add to 180. So this is gonna be equal to 180 minus the neighbor, 65. So that tells us that the measure of angle A, D, C equals, what is that, 115? Yes. Cool. Now John also wants us to find the measure of D, C, B. D, C, B. Okay, so we have to go to our picture and find those three letters. D, C, B, that's this angle. And how are we gonna find that? Well, we have two options. We know that it has to add to 180 with this one, but we also know it has a relationship with its opposite. And it's the same as its opposite, so let's just write that down. Both of those are viable strategies for finding this angle, but I mean, why not take the easy one, right? Okay, and then we have to solve for x and y. Now these are building off different truths about the parallelogram. This is building off the whole thing that the diagonals chop each other into equal halves. So we know that x plus two, this chunk is equal to this chunk, it equals seven. And y plus seven equals four. All right, so now we're going to solve for X and Y. Remember that those answers will give us an algebraic truth. Let, let me do it and then you'll see what I mean. Subtract two from both sides and we get X equals five. Subtract seven from both sides and we get Y equals minus three. Now, part of my brain goes, what? Minus three, why can't equal minus three? Because this, this is a length, it can't be a minus number. But remember, this isn't the length of anything. This is an expression that describes the length of this. But y in and of itself is just an algebraic answer. It's not a geometric answer. Same for x, this length is not five. It never has been. But it's the algebraic answer that I used from the geometry. So that can be kind of confusing and weird, but just remember that in these problems, we're mashing up geometry and algebra. Sometimes our answer is still in geometry mode. Other times our answer is more of an algebraic mode. Okay, are these all right? 115, 165, X is five and Y is minus three. Guess what? We got them all right. Once you get these you kind of get these rules in your brain. I find them to be kind of fun and satisfying because it's fine, kind of fun to take this picture that looks really hard and break it down. Let's do another one. Is this the last one? Yeah, this is the last one. This was a really long lesson. You deserve fresh air after this. A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. Find X and Y. All right. It's not as confusing as the first one, but there's still a lot going on in here. There's my parallelogram. This time the letters are in a different order. It's A, B, C, D. Sometimes the letters matter. Like last time we had to have them to find out the angles. 
Other times they don't matter, so we'll see. I just write them down because then I'm covered. All right, this says 10x plus 50. Now, sometimes an expression like this worries me because I think, what are these parentheses about? Don't let them scare you. What they're trying to say is that this whole thing is the measure of the angle, so the degree sign has to be, uh, the, we need parentheses to show that the, the degree sign applies to all of that, all right? So the parentheses are just kind of a fussy little touch we need to show that it's all the angle. This one is 5x plus 10. Again, fussy parentheses with the degrees. Don't let that freak you out. And then this one is y plus 10 degrees. Okay, find x and y. That's what we're supposed to do. All right. Well, what do we know about things like this? We know that neighbors add to 180 and opposites are the same. So I like to start with whatever strikes my brain first. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Woo, that was a good one. All right, these two I know are going to be opposites. So I'm going to write 10x plus 50 equals y plus 10. All right, that's true. I know that's true, but I see a problem. I have two different letters in one equation. That's not going to fly. That is not going to fly. So I think, all right, I better keep looking. Then I go, okay, well, I also know that neighbors add to 180. So what if I put these two together and made them add to 180? Well, that's not gonna fly either. 5x plus 10 plus y plus 10 equals 180. Because once again, look, I've got two letters in one equation. Well, if I really wanted to get fancy, I could simplify these and set them up as a system of equations and use either substitution or elimination to solve. But you know what? I'm not gonna do that. We've got one more shot, and I'm gonna try the third one. I'm gonna hang on to these though. I'm gonna try the third combination. These two are also neighbors. So I could say that 5x plus 10 plus 10x plus 50 equals 180, and I forgot to put the zero there. Okay, now, now that, you've, now that I've put you through this horrendous experience of trying all of them before we find the one that actually works, you can work smarter than me. I set it all up though, come on. Um, look for the two that share the same letter and try to write an equation with those two first. We see that Y is the interloper. Let's try to keep him out of the business until we solve for X. Then once we have a value for X, we can go back and use either one of these to solve for y. So that's what we'll do. We'll do this one first. This is our third option. And we're gonna do this one first because we can actually solve it. So I'm gonna combine like terms. 15x plus 60 equals 180. And then I'll subtract 60. Swim in those fish. That cancels. Um, when I had Algebra 1 in seventh grade, my teacher, whose name was Mr. Lecrone, um, or was it Lecrone? I can never remember. Anyway, it was kind of Frenchish. Uh, he always referred to this when we're adding or subtracting numbers to, to the both sides of an equation. He referred to that as swimming fish, um, meaning that schools of fish tend to move together. So here I've got plain number fish and plain number fish. I need to swim them so they're together. This cancels equals 130. And I'm gonna divide both sides by 15. And, wait, no, that's wrong. This is 120. There we go. Okay, I know that every pair of 15s, 15 times 2 equals 30. And I know there must be four 30s and 120, right? Because 4 times 3 is 12. So if there are four 30s, then there must be eight 15s. I don't know if you could follow my brain on that. 
but that's how I figure it out. I don't know how many 15s are in 120, but I know how many 30s are, four. And then I take into account that every 30 has to be two 15s, and that tells me that X equals eight. So far, so good, right? I like it. Now we have to go back and solve for one or the other of these, plugging our value for X into either one of these and then solving for Y. I'm gonna choose this one, 10X plus 50, no, this one, 10X plus 50 equals Y plus 10. So I'm gonna flip it over, because I ran out of space. And I'm gonna say, 10x plus 50 equals y plus 10. And you know what? My phone isn't charging, so hang on. Oh, y plus 10. Well, I'm just going to pray that it lasts till I finish. My battery's low. Ready? And now I know that y equals 8, so I'm going to say 10 times 8 plus 50 equals y plus, that should be a plus, plus 10. This is 80 plus 50, that's 130 equals y plus 10. I subtract 10 from both sides and I get 120 equals Y. And that's the right answer. Yay. All right, that is the end of lesson 37. Like I said, that was a marathon and you deserve a break at this point. Also, because this is Thanksgiving week, I'm giving you a break in your homework. I want you to do all the practice problems. That part's not the break, but that's reviewing what we just learned. And then, and this is just uh, for today's lesson, for lesson 37. I want you to do all the practice, and then I want you to do the problem set, one through 15 only, all right? So one, three, five, seven, nine, the odds, right? One, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, and 15. Okay, those are the problems I want you to do. Happy Thanksgiving week. I'll see you tomorrow for lesson 38. Thanks, bye.